Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome again to the Big Data Days, day number two, on track number two. I am very, very honored to have Saifula have with us today. Uh, he is actually a program lead at the School of Engineering and Technology for PSB Academy. Uh, today, uh, Saifula is going to uh, venture in this very unique topic called how big data can assist in the understanding of human intention. Mm, I'm very curious. So Saifula, over to you. Could you just take us through that interesting topic, please? Hello. Um, so as uh, as mentioned by the host just now, my name is Saifullah Razali. I am the program leader, uh, particularly on the program of Bachelor's Honours of Engineering, Robotics and AI. Um, this program is from University of Hertfordshire in UK, and we are running it here in Singapore at uh, this college called PSB Academy. I am also the program leader for Masters of Science in Data Science, uh, which... Uh, most of you already know, so I think it's connected. Data science is connected to robotics and AI. Everything is basically connected. Uh, I am also a PhD student in University of Hertfordshire, uh, Wollong uh, sorry, University of Wollongong in Australia, uh, and University of University Putra Malaysia, both in the field of artificial intelligence. So um, some. Parts of this talk is going to be based on my uh, PhD research as well. Okay, so uh, this talk is titled Can Machines Detect Human Intentions? So I am going to be answering this question uh, step by step uh, from the very beginning. So the subtopic of this topic is understanding human intentions through deep learning and big data. Okay, so first of all, we are going to be talking about big data itself. Okay, uh, like I said, we are going to be talking about it from the very beginning, which is IR 4.0, because all of these are actually parts of IR 4.0, right? Industrial Revolution 4.0. I'm sure uh, all of you already knows this. Uh, but before we talk about that, before we talk about IR 4.0, of course, IR 1.0 was the uh, predecessor of that, right? So we are just going to be talking about that for a few minutes first before I go into the real um, the real answer for that question just now. So uh, first of all, um, like I said, um, IR 4.0 is predecessor. Is that a word? <laughs> Uh, the predecessor of IR 4.0 is IR 1.0. We started in 1784 um, with mechanical production, railroads, and steam power. Okay, so everyone, instead of doing this uh, at uh, their houses, doing, doing stuff at their houses, like making food, making clothes, and so on at their houses, now all of these industries are moved into... Uh, into uh, steam powered uh, uh, steam powered factories okay steam powered factories um, are going to be making all of this in bulk so that they can sell it and um, the customers can buy this stuff uh, from them uh, this clothes and food and so on right so uh, instead of making it themselves it's it's an industry now. That's why it's called industry, industrial revolution. At that time, they don't know yet that it was industrial revolution, 1784. Uh, but then it was named after uh, it was created, after after it, it became a realization, right? So 1784 is when it happened. And then in the second industrial revolution, which started in 1870, uh, mass, mass production, uh, electrical power and the advent of the assembly line was created. This happened with the help of the birth of electric. Okay, electric started in this year, 1870. So because of that, uh, everything moved uh, from using steam power, uh, water, charcoal, and all this, uh, all this stuff that is happening in the first industrial revolu revolution. Uh, they moved to using electric because electric was born and it's more effective that way. It's more cost effective, it's more energy effective and so on. 
Um, in the third industrial revolution, uh, which started in 1969, um, the production started to become automatic a bit, okay, with the use of electronics, uh, electronic machines and computers and so on. Now, in the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence came into the picture. Okay, so for artificial intelligence to work, big data has to be there as well. We need a lot of data so that these machines can learn from the data and became intelligent. Okay, I'm using double quotes for now because uh, as you know, they are still, you know, making the accuracy uh, improving from time to time. Uh, robotics and more to come. Okay, so this is what's happening now. Industrial Revolution 4.0 which started somewhere after the year 2000. Okay, so this is what we are going to be talking about, the gist of the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, so the steps of getting to artificial intelligence, um, like I said, we are going to be starting with big data and then we are going to go into data analytics, data science, and then uh, finally artificial intelligence, step by step. Okay, how does uh, big data help data analytics? How does data analytics help uh, to create data science? How does uh, data science help to create artificial intelligence and so on? And then um, by the end of the talk, I'll be answering that main question of my talk. Okay, can it detect human intention? Okay, so big data is basically the collection of data all around us. So all around us, there's patterns, there's data, there's trends, and so on that could be collected, could be gathered, and could be experimented on. So this guy said something about this. Okay, From the dawn of civilization until 2003, humankind generated five exabytes of data. Now we produce five exabytes every two days. Okay, so... The five exabytes that are equivalent to from the dawn of civilization until 2003 is only uh, gathered in two days now. And the pace is accelerating. So this guy is not just some random guy. Uh, this is the executive chairman for Google. So he is um, one of the people or deep, is, deep person that is making all the executive uh, decisions at this big conglomerate Google, which all of you knows about, uh, called Eric Schmidt. So Eric Schmidt said this um, in uh, this book called Big Data in Practice. Okay, so this quote is taken directly from this book, Big Data in Practice. Uh, and it could be, uh, it could be exhaustive uh, sometimes, if this data is not really used, it's not really put any meaning onto it. So this is when data analytics come, okay, come in. From historical data, we can come up with some meaning. Okay, so this meaning uh, is what we put onto the data itself, the big data, like so. Okay, this is an example of that. Um, so for your information, this is a real world data. This is actually the Titanic data set. Okay, I'm sure some of you already uh, already familiar are already familiar with this data set. Uh, this is not the whole data set. This is a snippet of it. Uh, it's not that the Titanic is only bordered by 21 passengers, but this is a snippet of that big data set that we have uh, for the Titanic tragedy. Right, so I'm sure all of you already knows about the Titanic tragedy, so I'm not going to go into it. Uh, there's already a Hollywood movie made about it, also. So um, the the most important part of this data set is this column, actually, survive or not, right? Whether people survive the Titanic data set or not. So zero stands for not did not survive. One stands for survive. So. This is going to be the label that we are going to be analyzing on. Okay, so based on the passenger ID, the other features, okay, passenger ID, passenger class, name, uh, sex, age, sibling, spouse, uh, parents, children, uh, ticket, okay, uh, fare, how much did they pay uh, to get onto the Titanic ship, okay, Titanic cruise, the cabin number, 
embark from okay so s could be seattle c could be chicago uh, these are this might be the ports that they embark from so all of these features can tell us whether whether if there's going to be a titanic 2 for example um and we put in some test passengers with some similar features are they going to be survived or not using machine learning right we're using machine learning algorithms okay so i'm not going to get into the technicalities of machine learning algorithms uh but that's what happens okay so uh from that analysis we can create beautiful graphs like this right so now uh this is only based on the passengers age we can safely say that uh, from this graph uh, passengers with the age of 40 to 60 has the higher highest chance of surviving the Titanic tragedy if it happens again, for example. Okay, so this is the meaning behind data analytics that we put based on the data that we already have historically, right? Historic historically, we gathered that data and now we are doing analysis on it. And now we can we can come up with some meaning. Okay, so after data analytics, data science comes in. Okay, from meaning, we can come up with some predictions. Okay, this is another real world scenario. Uh, Rachel Wood is trying to, she is, she was interviewed. She was interviewed as a social media strategist in one of the biggest conglomerates uh, out there that is using machine learning to detect whether Rachel Wood is a suitable candidate for social media strategist uh, position or not. Okay, and then um, the machine is going to give her some rating so that the decision makers, us, the human beings, for now, for now we are still the decision makers uh, at the end, right? At the final stage, us as the human beings are going to make a decision, but based on the prediction made by these machines. Okay, so as you can see, this screen uh, consists of Rachel's face, Rachel's tone of voice that you can see up and down here, and maybe uh, the words that Rachel used for the interview. Okay, so from those features, uh, all of these features are going to be called sometimes as modality, okay, image. Well, let's just call image as modality A tone as modality B, words as modality C. There's actually 25,000 data points in total for a video that we can gather. But uh, for the sake of this example, let's just talk about these three modalities for now. Okay, and then we put these three modalities into a table like this. Um, A stands for image just now. So maybe uh, according to the machine learning analysis that we did just now on the video, uh, it says that, um, it says that, what's her name again? Rachel, right? <laughs> okay, it says that Rachel's image is not so suited. So that's why there's a zero here. Uh, not so suited to be the social media strategist. And then um, the words used is good. The tonality of her voice is good. So because of that, uh, the machine learning analysis is going to say that she is good for social media strategist uh, position, according to the machine learning analysis that we have done at the back end. Okay, um, the second candidate comes in. The same process is going to be repeated. Okay, uh, image good, uh, words use good, tonality maybe not so good, but still true, still, still a good fit for this uh, for this position and then we have another candidate comes in um, image good but the words used are not so good and tonalities use is very good it's good okay uh, but still false because of the words used are not very good for this particular position okay so that is data science coming up with a prediction whether someone is good or not not only that not only someone is good for a position or not, any kind of predictions, right? Uh, whether it's going to be raining tomorrow or not, whether someone is going to survive the Titanic tragedy or not, and so on, okay? Okay, artificial intelligence is the umbrella 
for many fields now. Okay, we have neuromorphic computing, cognitive cybersecurity, robotic personal assistant, autonomous surgical robotics, next gen cloud robotics, top control gaming, real time universal translation, visual companions, even uh, real time emotion analytics, uh, chatbots, and so on and so forth. Okay, so my research is actually on this part uh, in this field, natural language processing, NLP. So I'm just going to the focus, I'm just going to focus on natural language processing in answering that question just now. Okay, whether machines can detect human intentions or not. Okay, there's going to be other modalities as well, as you can see just now. Uh, if we take videos as our data, then there's going to be 25,000 data points that you can uh, you can extract from. The facial expression, the micro expression, macro expression, the words used, uh, the subtle words that I use and so on, um, body gesture and so on. There's going to be many data points that you can extract from videos. Um, but in terms of my research, uh, we are just going to be talking about words, natural language processing. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> coming into my research is about detecting intention, human intention through figurative language. So figurative languages, there are many types of figurative languages like metaphor, sarcasm, satire, uh, hyperbole, and so on and so forth. The problem, the main problem with figurative language is that it's not literal, right? We don't know what's the intention, the real intention behind it, right? Like if I say to you, I like you, and then I say to you, I like you. <laughs> so that haha at the end makes all the difference right between these two instances this one is sarcastic and this one is not this one is literal this one is figurative okay i have i have a hidden meaning uh behind the second instance just now okay um, and metaphor is one part of figurative language one type of figurative language just now i use the the example of sarcasm because it's easier i guess than metaphor metaphor is more complicated but now i'm going to be talking about metaphor metaphor is one type of figurative language it is a literary concept based on resemblance it is the substitution of one notion for another in virtue of analogy between them the concept for example the concept competition can be taken as another concept sickness or disease by exploiting the properties of the first concept okay so the concept sickness can be can be talked about as as a competition okay in this case uh, this then can be used in conversations such as beat cancer so we don't actually go and beat cancer physically literally uh, it's just a metaphor like we go and beat cancer like we beat a person like we beat up a person or fight the virus together. We don't actually go and fight the virus literally, physically, but we can use that word fight to, to make the audience easily understand what we are doing, right? Because we are so, um, we, are, we already understand what fight means, right? So in order for us to, to make uh, the audience understand that we are actually, you know, trying to cure this virus. We just say we fight the virus together. Okay. Okay. Um, so some literature review, uh, some work that has been done on this figurative language detection or intention detection, uh, or more specifically metaphor detection. Okay. So this researchers, Tony, and the team manually extracted the degree of abstractness for each word and trained a logistic regression classifier. So logistic regression is one machine learning algorithm that can help with the detection task. Okay, so manually extracted the degree of abstractness from metaphors on these words uh, and fed it into this logistic regression to detect whether it's met a metaphorical instance or not okay so this is what Tony and the team has done in 2011 and then in 2014 Klebanov and the team manually extracted features such as unigrams and POS 
and train a logistic regression classifier for the detection task. Okay, so again, this team is using logistic regression uh, to do this, okay, to, to uh, sort of extract all of these features, unigrams. Unigrams are basically just one word by one word uh, and POS as well, and then extract it and then uh, put it in this classifier, logistic regression classifier, which is actually just a mathematical equation. Uh, at, at the back end. So this mathematical equation uh, is used to, to detect uh, whether an instance is metaphoric or not uh, using these features, unigrams and POS. Okay, and then another team, Zhang and the team, manually extracted topic transitions and trained an SVM. SVM stands for Support Vector Machine uh, Classifier for the detection task. Uh, in 2015, okay, and then uh, Bizoni and the team compared the performance between two deep learning architectures. So now in 2018, people start using neural nets, okay, deep learning uh, to do this kind of detection for the detection task. Okay, one is a by LSTM model and another is an MLP model. Okay, multi-layer perceptron model uh, is used. Uh, uh, as one of the model by this team, Bizoni and the team, and by long short term memory is used as another model by this Bizoni and team again. Okay, just just to have a comparison of uh, which one is better to detect this kind of uh, this kind of task, this kind of figurative language. Okay, now I came into the picture to try to give some leverage to this field. Okay, so this is the framework that uh, I have uh, proposed and presented uh, already. Um, so as you can see, the input is the data set, obviously, and then the data set is going to go through a pre-processing uh, process, pre-processing technique, uh, and then it's going to go through word embedding technique called fast text, which was created by Facebook. And then it's going to go into a, a convolutional neural network, okay? And not only that, uh, the pre-processed data set also will go through, excuse me, this, this other algorithm called emotion feature. I'm going to be extracting some emotional feature from the data set, cognitive feature as well hidden metaphor feature as well. Okay, so we are going to be talking about all of these features, how I extracted them uh, in the next uh, slide. But for now, uh, I just want to show you that in my research, I've used a neural network, a deep learning, uh, and also some traditional methods as well. So I took inspirations from all of these people actually from 2011 until 2018. So 2018, like I said earlier, people have started to use deep learning uh, neural network. And that is where I got the inspiration of using neural network now. And before that, people has been using traditional methods like this, okay, logistic regression and also SVM. So I have used that traditional method here at the bottom part of my, uh, my framework here and I have used deep learning at the top part of my framework here and then all of the features from both of these techniques are going to be extracted and classified. Okay so this is where I explain to you how I extracted the emotion part okay the first part emotion feature okay how I extracted it is just by comparing a library a library called LIWC. I'm sure uh, if some of you is into natural language processing, you are familiar with this library, LIWC, um, to see whether there are um, there are words that that can be uh, compared to between the library and the instances that I've got in the data set, right? And these words are actually categorized by uh, by emotional uh, categories. Okay, for example, the first category is affect. Okay, so this category will have words like ache, 
like and so on so just words okay we are not looking at the facial features or the tone of the voice and so on because like i said this is nlp so i'm just focusing on the words in this particular uh, example in this particular part of my thesis okay uh, and then we have positive emotion using words such as passion agree and so on negative emotion for example agony annoy and so on anxiety for example embarrass avoid and so on Anger, for example, assault, offense, and so on. And then sadness, for example, despair, grim, and so on. Okay, so those are emotional words. When we are talking about cognitive words, we can extract uh, words in the category of insight, for example, belief, aware. Uh, words in the category of certainty, for example, never, true, and so on. Uh, words in the category of cognitive, for example, if could and so on okay okay uh, when when it comes to hidden metaphorical words we can use positional words such as above after around we can use directional words such as behind below beside distance words such as nine near elevation uh, size words such as beefy immeasurable short and so on Okay, for example, you can say that uh, you can say to someone that is actually small in size, uh, like like a son or a nephew, for example, you can say that you are a big man now, even though literally he is not big, right? Uh, so that is a metaphor using size words. Okay, that's, that's just uh, one example, okay, which is actually backed up by... Uh, other research okay so by doing that by using both of the methods traditional methods traditional machine learning methods and also deep learning uh, deep learning which is also part of machine learning uh, i have managed to get uh, a good f1 measure 0.83 or 83 percent uh, precision 0.84 or 84 percent and recall 0.83 or 83 percent so that means uh, that uh, machines are actually making an improvement in detecting uh, human human beings' intentions. Okay, behind this figurative language. Okay, so uh, like I said earlier, uh, my research just now uh, is only focusing on LLP, uh, which are the words. But we can do this using other features as well. For example, um, we can extract the postsynaptic current in our brains um, and magnetic field. We can extract as well. We can put it in beautiful graphs like this and we can change it into images. Okay, And we can analyze these images okay, using CNN and RNN and whatnot and then come up with with uh, a classification like what i did with my words as well okay okay so talking about the improvement of machines right uh, i'm sure all of you might already know this uh, but machines actually do not become more and more intelligent the same way as humans, right? Humans have linear growth in intelligence. Uh, machines have exponential growth in intelligence. So an example of exponential equation is like this, y equals to 3x plus 1. So whenever x is 1, y would become 4. Whenever x is 2, y would become 7. Whenever x is 3, y would become 10, and so on and so forth creating this kind of graph, okay? It's not a linear one like this for us human beings, right? Um, so this is an example of that. Artificial intelligence software has surpassed humans in classifying objects in images from a database it's been trained on, okay? So it's not our forte, not to say our forte. Uh, we are not the only one. We as a species, as human beings, are not the only one. We are not even the best at classifying objects in data sets. Okay, we, we look at the, the images, we look at the photos, uh, we might take some time to differentiate between uh, the photos of dogs or cats, 
right? Uh, because machines has already surpassed us in classifying objects uh, in the year 2016, I would say. So this is where the singularity happened on the stars. And after that, after that, it has surpassed us. Okay, of course, it's not going to stay the same all the time. One of this is going to surpass another, right? So in this case, in this task, in this specific task, machines has already surpassed us. And it's getting very close to 100% accuracy now uh, in order for them to classify objects on a photo, okay? Okay, so AI intelligence again is exponential. The growth is exponential through time. So um, this red line here is depicting that. Okay, it's depicting AI intelligence. So it's going faster and faster, as I'm sure all of you already know. So here, um, here we might say, okay, we might say that that is adorable the funny robot can do monkey tricks because the robot can actually do can actually think like monkeys uh, like chimps okay but you know through time it's going it's going more and more intelligent and maybe it can even surpass our champion and stein uh, in the near future okay okay so i think this is my last slide Okay, so I'll just be taking questions after this. This is going to be my last slide. Um, so to end my talk, uh, this is an AI timeline that makes me a bit scared. Uh, optimist as well, but also a bit scared uh, because looking at this particular year, right? 1997, when this machine called Deep Blue uh, has surpass has beaten our champion at that time uh, which is gary kasparov um a uh, uh, champion uh, uh chess grandmaster that came from russia uh, which is which is the best chess player at that time okay not just any chess player the best chess player at that time has been beaten by this machine deep blue okay which i'm sure some of you already knows about this and then in 2017 <clears throat> a similar thing has happened. Um, this machine AlphaGo from Google. Google created this machine AlphaGo that has beaten um, another champion of us, KG, uh, uh, who is the champion of this board game called Go. Okay, It's like a Chinese board game, like a Chinese chess, but much more complex than chess. Um, this machine AlphaGo has also beaten this world champion on this other uh, board game, which is much more complex than uh, chess. Now, you see, the difference is about 20 years, right? 1997 until 2017 is about 20 years. Now, it's almost uh, it's going into another 20 years, and we don't, we don't know what it's going to be capable of after this 20 years, after, after 2017, right? So that's why I'm optimist, but also a bit scared. Okay, so there's one slap on the face to the human species in 1997, another slap on the face to the human species in 2017. So now I guess uh, we'll just have to see what's going to happen in the next 20 years, okay? And uh, like I said, that would be the last slide for my presentation. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, I'll be taking well. some questions. Yep. No, if, thank you for, for sharing that. I didn't know that there were so many um, uh, what we call components to a language itself. Uh, because yesterday, I think we had a guest speaker was explaining to us on the Arabic uh, sub-dialect. There are 26 of them. So I, I did share mm -hmm. a little bit on my experience in that because uh, my parents are both Hakka, but my dad and my mom uh -huh spoke a, I mean, they, they do speak a sub-dialect of the Hakka. So I get confused mm -hmm. when my parents start talking to each other. Uh, it's supposed to be uh -huh. a dialect in a sense, but they're all speaking in sub-dialect. So I'm like, uh, guys, seriously, can we use English? 
<laughs> so I get confused I when it comes to languages in that sense, right? Because uh, in China yes. itself, there are what sixty main sub dialects and three hundred sub dialects, which is again super confusing. I mean, uh, it's such a big country, right? So we're just talking about English, and there are so many things as well, like you said, right? How do you uh, yeah. predict or how do you even understand the human intention? Right. We see some questions in the uh, chat itself. Let me just bring them up. So I'm going to just project the question. This is from Sebastian. So Sebastian is actually curious to ask, are neural networks always superior over multiplayer perceptrons? Hmm, this is an interesting one. Perhaps you can help us out, uh, Saifullah. Okay, uh, so neural networks, uh, as I understand, is uh, getting uh, better and better accuracy uh, at all times. Um, so I wouldn't say they are always superior than anything, mm -hmm. uh, but in some specific tasks, they would, they would be more superior, like uh, what I just uh, showed in my presentation yeah. just now. Um, you know, uh, the classification of object from photos, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, some tasks, I would say they are more superior, but not all yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Okay. I hope, Sebastian, you are happy with that question. Let's look at another question. Uh, let me just put that up. Uh, this is from an anonymous uh, from one of our audience. He says, how do you deal with words that could be both positive and negative? So he uh, used an example like priceless, right? So that's another interesting word that I never thought of. How, how do you differentiate that? Is that positive sense or a negative or what kind of connotation or how do you uh, differentiate that? Okay, thank you, uh, attendee one. This is a very good question. I came across this kind of uh, issue all the time while oh. using this, uh, while doing this NLP experiments, right? Oh. Um, when one word has two polarities, right? Yep. Um, yeah, that depends not only on the word, it depends on the word before it and after it as well. For example, there are many techniques, yeah, to, there are many techniques to realize this. There's also a technique called sentence completion. So, um, which word is the best word or words that could come after this few words? Okay, so... Um, all of these techniques uh, you can learn about to see whether whether uh, a specific word could be used as a positive or negative word or both at the same time. Sometimes they are both at the same time. Hmm. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. It's not about the word itself. It's about how it is used in a sentence Okay, or while, while we are talking. Right? I see. I see. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is also related to how chat GPT at the moment is also uh, taking in right. the text itself, right? Uh, for for right. me at yeah. home, uh, just to share with you, I'm actually uh, experimenting with the uh, Google Home Mini, the, the smart speaker uh, for the last what, four or five years I have them in my apartment. Uh, yes. My wife always complained, why are you talking to the machine again? So I'm trying <laughs> to also get how they actually interpret my voice, uh, how the commands that I issue like, hey, Google, could you do this? Could you do that? By the way, so it's up. Yeah. yeah, so uh, over time, because in my household, there are four people uh, with my two kids as well. So they've also tried that. I find that over the years, uh, it has actually improved in responding, uh, in finding things on the internet, because I can actually get it to uh, search for YouTube video uh, to project it on my so-called not-so-smart TV, which I've connected to the Google Chrome class. And it actually yeah. works. I'm like, hmm, over the years, yeah. I think because I, yes. I am the product now. <laughs> so yes, I, yes, yes. I kind of train it uh, in a way. I've also got a smart lighting in the living room, you know, connected it to switch on. Yes. Switch off. Yeah, I think this NLP mm. is quite interesting in that sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Adding up to, yeah. Sorry, John. What were you well, saying? I, was, I was just trying to appreciate what's your thoughts on this future development? Uh, where where oh, is yeah, that going yeah. to lead us to? <laughs> Yeah, just uh, just to answer this question and adding up to what you just said, John, um, this uh, smart home technologies, right? Like Google mm -hmm. Home or Alexa even. Yep. Um, while you are using it, they are actually collecting data from you to become smarter, right? So that is the best or maybe slightly scary thing about it. it, is. Uh, that, it yeah, that it collects data while we are using it and that actually makes it smarter and smarter, right? 
So yeah, so my advice on this, if I may, is uh, try to use kind words to your machines as well, not <laughs> just to your human peers. <laughs> Well, so, so far, that it can I, I be said, also kind. Ground rule that there are no swear words allowed in the household <laughs> against human right. beings. Because, like I said, right. I, I think it's quite fascinating when I came across the smart speaker, like I said, five years ago, and, and yeah. I wanted to really explore what they could do. Of course, it's still at the very rudimentary uh, stage, but now after five years, right, he can actually, I mean, the, the speaker can actually differentiate between my voice, my wife, and then the kids, right? when they issue a command, you know, and then when they ask to search for stuff. Uh, I still remember my wife, uh, when she uh, played with me, she said, uh, hey, Google, please tell a bedtime story to the kids. And then she said, bye, walk out of the room. So the kids were like, all right, where's the mom? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it actually did a decent job in recognizing the voice. Yeah, so I find that yes. quite interesting. In, in that yeah. Sense. yeah, because uh, your your tone of voice, your melody of the voice are actually data as well. Right, that can be, yeah, that can be gathered and also given back to you. But so far, I think I think the emotional part, I think I think will probably depend on your research. How 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 do I sound? Do I sound happy? Do I sound angry? Do I sound sad? Uh, I think that yes. part I have not seen that in the uh, smart home or the smart speaker yet. Uh, in responding, yeah. uh, responding or reinteracting with me at this point in time, yeah. uh, it's still very rudimentary uh, as as yes. I see it. But hopefully, with your research, uh, we can uh, propel us a little bit further ahead in the future. <laughs> that you can tell me, oh, John, you are not feeling a uh, very uh, what we call happy today. Is there something that's yes. bothering you? Or and then yes. you say, oh, I look at your schedule. You have a very packed back to back day. Uh, hosting yes. the uh, big data days today. Oh, <laughs> is that why you're not happy? <laughs> you know? Or could I order uh, some ice cream for you? You know, for today. You know, <laughs> yeah. that will be interesting. You know, as a personal. Yes. Yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah. Right. So, Ifula, thank you so much for that interesting sharing on your research. I wish you all the best. Uh, hopefully, thank you. Uh, you will get to that end of it, and we will all benefit with your research results. Uh, like I said. I really look forward to more intelligence from that basic, uh, you know, stuff that we have now, and hopefully we can actually get to uh, do more as technology progress. Thank you again, Saifullah, for uh, joining you, us Dylan. today. Right yeah. for the rest of the audience, uh, please do join us on the upcoming uh, panel discussion that is actually showing on the screen now. Uh, we hope to see you in that session shortly. All right, thank you, everybody. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Bye.